since we're all regulars, we're not going to have to do the usual housekeeping. I think everybody knows our general approach to discussion. And uh, so I thought I thought I'd start off uh, learning from uh, Kim. She's got a great style and presentation. So mm -hmm. I thought I'd do an overview of the Parsha. So um, it's numbers 19, 1 through 22, 1. Uh, Chukat or Chukas, depending on whether you're Ashkenazi or Sephardi. Uh, and we introduced the ritual of the red cow by Hashem. So it's basically used to purify people who've been ritually contaminated by contact with the dead. Uh, the person doing the purification in turn becomes con contaminated, has to take remedial steps to purify themselves. So that seems like an odd circular reasoning kind of thing. And there's a lot of commentary around what is the nature of this law. And it fits into one category of law we call a chok, which is really a decree by Hashem. It has no obvious um, rational meaning. Some, some commandments are testimonial. Some commandments are judicial and legalistic in nature. They have a practical nature. But some handful of uh, commandments they're just decrees by Hashem, like keeping kosher is, a, is another example, right? There's no immediate rational reason. We still dig for a meaning, but there's not one that's uh, given uh, outright. And then immediately we segue into the story that Miriam dies, and it's linked to losing the water. Uh, if you're familiar with the Chumash up to this point, there was a rock that followed the uh, congregation of Israel through the desert. It provided water, and it did so in Miriam's merit. So when she died, the water went away, and that sets up the confrontation of Moses with the congregation, because now the congregation has a legitimate complaint. They're complaining that uh, they've had to deal with the uniformity of food, and now they're losing water. Um, and that's kind of an interesting complaint, because for the one of the first times, Israel is now complaining about something which might be considered legitimate, but they're not suggesting they're going to go back to Egypt, which is an interesting statement. So there's been a shift in tone, even in the complaints of Israel. So Moses is commanded by God to, to bring water because it's a reasonable request if you're in the middle of the desert. All right. And the intent of this is for Moses to sanctify God's name by doing a minor miracle in front of the entire um uh, congregation, but Miriam has just died. His sister has just died. He's not exactly in the best emotional place to be the prophetic leader of Israel. Uh, according to the Midrash, he actually loses track of which rock was the one that was giving water, and he was supposed to speak to the rock, but he couldn't find the rock. So he basically hunts around, and he gets a little testy, Again, he's in this emotional state. He's just lost his uh, his uh, sister. So he winds up striking a rock in order to bring uh, water. Uh, and Aaron is a participant in this to some extent as well. But losing his temper was not considered appropriate for his station, for his role as a leader of Israel at that time. And he and Aaron subsequently are going to be punished because of this, because this very angry act is not a sanctification of God. It's not symbolic of how you sanctify. If he would have spoken to the rock and the rock would have given water, it would have been a sanctification. Parsha goes on. Moses uh, is traveling around with the people of Israel, and they come up against the borders of Edom. Uh, Edom is the uh, community run by Asa, the distant relative of the Jewish people, and Moses asks to pass through. I just lost the slide. Sorry about that. I accidentally That's all right. changed my screen by accident here. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> okay. So he's asking for passage through land from a nation that has some kind of a connection and relationship to Israel, but Edom denies that passage. So Israel has to reroute around their travel around their borders. And, and there's a, the whole discussion about their travels and where they went in order to skirt those boundaries. And then it goes on, and Aaron dies on the way, and he's succeeded by his son, Ali, uh, Elazar, uh, due to his part in the stone of water, meaning Aaron dies because he's related to this event. So now Moses has lost 
is two siblings, right? And we're in a transitional period where Moses as prophet is trying to hand off the people uh, to ultimately enter the land of Israel. Israel might actually be needing a different kind of a leader uh, because the prophetic leader may not be the appropriate one for being actually in the land. So the people start to complain about the roundabout route. They're so close to the border. They're not shortening the way. They're fearing dying in the desert. So there's this episode where Hashem sends a bunch of serpents to attack the complaining people. So <clears throat> a plague, a plague of serpents. Moses resorts to, he's asked, he's told by Hashem to create a copper serpent, put it on a pole to stop the plague in order to help the people. Um, so that episode passes, and then Israel continues on and is traveling. It meets up with Sion, and they defeat him in battle, and they continue to fight through, and they actually get to the bank of the Jordan River opposite Jericho. So that's essentially the uh, the game plan for this, but it's it's a heavily loaded uh, partial with things that don't seem to be uh, immediately related. So we're going to go back to the red count and see if we can make some connections here. So we're going to move on to the next slide. So the, the next slide has to do with actual news about the red heifer. So back in 2018, the first red heifer, heifer in the last 2,000 years has been born. So this was big news. It made the rounds in certain Christian circles. It certainly made the rounds in Jewish uh, circles. And it turns out that the Temple Institute in Jerusalem has actually been working with American breeders uh, to bring forward the red cow. And as of 2018, we actually have got uh, one or two of these cows now. So this is an interesting um, uh, innovation in and of itself. Let's move on to the next slide. A little bit more news rela relating to that episode. So this has to do, there was news about Jewish activists crowdfunding in order to pay for the breeding of the red cow. So that's kind of a, a functional organizational way of bringing about something that hasn't existed for 2000 years and it's actually bearing fruit. And the cattlemen in, uh, I guess, Texas, uh, working with the Temple Institute have actually uh, raised uh, a small herd of the red heifer. So as we're approaching the so-called end of days, one of the requirements is to reinstitute this ritual of purification using the red cow. And it is only in the recent years that we've actually reached the point where this has happened. So this is kind of, um, I would call it explosive news, though it seems to float below the radar in mainstream media. Uh, they don't care too much about religious issues or prophetic events. They don't headline them typically. Uh, but th these are interesting things if, if you're sensitive to what's going on spiritually in the world. And as your ear mentioned earlier, it's another one of those signposts that something is happening, something is changing, something is being prepared. So I thought that was kind of interesting. So now let's move on to the next slide. So this has to do with a little bit more about the red heifer. There were nine in the past. There's been a 2000 year hiatus. The tenth has now been being prepared. So we see that the 10th heifer is uh, emblematic or, or um, uh, of the coming of the Messiah. It's part of the messianic effort. It's one of the things the Messiah is gonna actually be involved in. So you need a, a, you need a herd of heifers if this is even going to happen. Now, the person hasn't showed up yet, but the cows have. So maybe that's uh, a foreshadowing of what's going to uh, happen in the near future. So there is linkage to end of days to the relevancy of the red heifer in this portion this week. So let's move on to the question page. So, uh, no, no, yeah, you skipped one. Just so, so some of the verses from the, from the, so we're raising a number of questions. Why was it necessary to mention Miriam? So Miriam plays into this uh, because she was destined not to enter into the land. Um, and the water was in her merit. Uh, that's why they did run out. That's the other question. And now Moses has to re reinstitute that in order to keep going and keeping the people together. Uh, we're asking the question, why weren't the people punished? I alluded to this before. They didn't ask 
for the, the loss of water and did not threaten or complain that they needed to go back to Egypt. Now they're no longer complaining about going back. They still want to go forward. So because it was a rational complaint and because they weren't talking about going back to Egypt, Hashem thought it was appropriate, and that's why he commanded Moshe to uh, reinstitute the water. Uh, interesting statement. King Solomon had actually wrote about this at Ecclesiastes. He couldn't fully understand this ritual with the red cow. And I thought I'd bring something from Rabbi Sachs that talked about uh, the elusiveness of this whole red cow um, uh, idea and how it relates to death. So this is what uh, Rabbi Sachs, the fate of man is the fate of cattle. The same fate awaits them both. The death of one is like the death of the other. Their spirits are the same. And the preeminence of man over beast is nothing for it is shallow, for it is all shallow breath. All end in the same place. All emerge from the death and all go back to dust. That's from, that's quote from Ecclesiastes that Rabbi, uh, that King uh, Solomon wrote. So Rabbi Sachs goes on to write, the knowledge that he will die robs Kohelet or Solomon of any sense of the meaningful, meaningfulness of life. We have no idea what will happen after our death to what we have achieved in life. Death makes a mockery of virtue. The hero may die young while the coward lives to old age. The bereavement is tragic in a different way. To lose those we love is to have the fabric of our life torn, perhaps irreparably, Death defiles in the simplest, starkest sense. More, mortality opens an abyss between us and God's eternity. It is this fear, this existential and elemental fear to which the right of the heifer is addressed. The animal self is the starkest symbol of pure animal life, untamed, undomesticated. The red, like the scarlet of the wool, is the color of blood, the essence of life. The cedar, the tallest of trees, representative of vegetative life. The ritual includes cedar and hyssop. Hyssop symbolizes purity. All these were reduced to ash in the fire, a powerful drama of mortality. The ash itself was then dissolved in the water, symbolizing continuity, the flow of life, and the potential of rebirth. The body dies, but the spirit flows on. A generation dies, but another is born. Lives may end, but lives, life does not. Those who live after us continue what we began and we live on in them. Life is never ending stream and the trace of us is carried on to the future. So I thought Rabbi Sachs's words were very good because it, it, it gives us a little bit of a perspective into this rather strange ritual. And this red cow mixed with being burned to ash, mixed with the water, with the high sup and the cedar, is not terribly explainable, but philosophically, we've struggled with this for many, many thousands of years. Uh, and this is our best attempt at understanding the relevancy of that particular uh, ritual. So now we can go on to the questions that we're gonna break out into. So I've already given some of the answers for some of this. Why is the command here after the building of the tabernacle and invoking the priesthood? What is the significance of death in our lives that we're contaminated by the serpent in the Genesis story? In Genesis, we were deprived of this eternal life when Adam and Eve fell after they ate the fruit. So now we have to deal with the notion of death. So this is part of how we do that. What are, what are the implications of stating the laws of the red cow that as an eternal decree? So again, that word eternal keeps cropping up throughout the Torah. It talks about laws that are eternal. When God claims that a law is something that is eternal, it can't be erased and it can't be stopped. So it has to have significance even in our own day. And that's sort of a hint towards the end of days. Why did Moses need to speak to the rock and break forth water? And how is this related to Miriam? We already spoke of that. Why was Moses and Aaron punished for this act? We sort of implicated around that. And why did Edom refuse Moses' transit request? That's an interesting thing. We have to get into the relationship between Asaph and Jacob in order to figure that out. And I'll leave that to the breakout rooms to discuss. Why did Moses make a serpent out of copper? What influence has this 
had on us, even in the modern day, two ways. What is the significance of the symbol of the serpent or the copper? Because it actually exists in our modern era. And in terms of this concept of a pure, need for purification to regain this sense of purity in the modern world, what is it that we are missing here in the modern world that makes purification rituals of any sort in any religion seem arcane and unnecessary? That's a bit of a sociological question, but I think it's something worth kicking around. Moving on to the last slide. So this is a bit of a treatise. I'm not going to read the slide, but understanding purity is a spiritual concept. This is something I got out of the Temple Institute. So the cause of impurity has to do with our connection with death. It takes something from us. It makes us incomplete. It somehow taints us in some spiritual sense, not in any biological sense. So the impurity, uh, from this point of view, retards or repels holiness. We need to regain holiness in this world. And some of that has to do through our actions, through our introspection, and our focus on why we do things and how we do things, and how we acknowledge that openly in the way we live a more sanctified life. In this world, especially in Israel, certainly in Jerusalem, and eventually in the Holy Temple, may it be built in our days soon. Um, what I thought was very interesting is the item in red at the bottom. So when it questions why, why all of this is needed, it says, in reality, within the answer lies the core of what distinguishes Judaism, the faith of the one God of Israel, for while ancient heathenism paid tribute to gods of death, who claimed everything and everyone as their own and overpowered all, Judaism pays no heed to death. While other religions viewed and still view life as a preparation for death and thus the center of their lives around death is the main event of the human experience, Judaism is supposed to be a celebration of life. So part of the ritual of the red cow has to do with this continuity idea where we're mixing the ashes of the current cow with the prior cow in order to sanctify and purify and keep this connection and this chain of life going through our various generations. So I think that sort of wraps up uh, my presentation. Hopefully I haven't gone over time too much. Well, no, we, thank you, Alan. Um, there's a lot in this reading, so no one, <laughs> no one would fault you for taking some time. So Kim, I think we can uh, just go ahead and break out into the rooms and get into it. Okay. All right. See you all on the other side. Alan raised the question of how are all these different stories connected? We really found that it's also completely connected in, in many interesting ways. Ruth, for example, mentioned uh, citing what Rabbi Foreman said, that the word aduma, paraduma, or the red heifer, Adam has the word Adam in it. <clears throat> and then when we talked about the nation of Edom, that we wanted to uh, go through them in order to enter the land, and we had to skirt around it because they didn't let us, that is Edom. So we see Adam, Edom, Adama, and uh, and then uh, Rick mentioned that uh, Asav is also, um, you know, has that red in it, and that it reminds us of blood and 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 perhaps uh, death and how we have to deal. It, it it just all got so beautifully connected. We had just we had a great time. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Here. It's interesting what you just said because here he you know the Torah could use the word behemoth. I mean, it could use the word for animal. It could have, it could have used a different word than Adama for the red heifer. It, you know, so it's interesting that it chose that particular word in its connection. And and another big thing that 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 we discussed a lot was the connection between the red heifer and the golden calf, because in the golden calf we have the similar. Um, process that seems to take place where after they do the golden calf Moshe grinds it into into dust right just like we do here with the red heifer and then he puts it into the live water 
and then everybody drinks it, which kind of connects also the story of drinking from the rock, right? So you have here, um, I, I think the, the, that the sage, the medrash connects these two stories. And he says that the mother of the calf, right? The red heifer, who's the mother of the golden calf should now clean up the mess. So there's also a connection here between the red heifer and cleaning up the mess of the golden calf. And then we talked about how that doesn't happen in one generation, it takes many generations. So we really need a constant um, rebirth of the nation with every generation in order to be able to move away from the way, the pagan waves of the golden calf to the, the temple where we will all need the, gold, the, the red heifer in order to be able to go and pray in the temple together. So uh, we just had a great time. <laughs> um, <clears throat> yeah, one thing that came up in our, our uh, room, if anyone wants to share, just wave at me or put up your hand or something. Um, but quickly, uh, was this idea of the water. And we talked about, you know, ashes. Uh, Alan brought up some of the um, oral Torah that talks about this rock that travels, you know, with the, we, we kind of went over that again a second time because the question came up that uh, this, uh, this actually pops up, this rock that followed Israel in the uh, New Testament writings as well. So Dave uh, brought that up, was asking, you know, a bit more information. Um, but this idea of water, that that, that that was the central, I kind of threw out the idea, you know, that maybe the water is much more central than the ashes in the sense that the, the ash always goes into the water and threw out an idea and interpretation that maybe, you know, the ash represents the end of potential of a particular type of creation. And the water represents the return to a, a beginning, a kind of potential state, and, you know, and so this, this recycling, if I can use that term here, uh, this returning to a, a new beginning so that you can start again, so that you can, you know, and the idea of being washed or the idea of being cleansed in a way of an, an impurity, uh, it kind of seemed to, to fit. You know, you know I, where that well is today, you know, Miriam's well. Well, in our group, I think Alan brought up that it might be under the Galilee, but that was just... It's it, according to some, uh, you know, some of the more mystical uh, traditions, it's actually in the Kinneret in a very, very well-defined spot. So next time you come and visit us in the galley, we'll point it out to you. Okay. But a lot of people really relate to the Kinneret as, uh, I mean, the truth is that the Kinneret does provide water for all of Israel. So it's like, kind of, you can actually see how it continues. No one, yeah. <laughs> it continues to provide water for all, for the entire land of Israel. That's, that's really quite amazing, I think. Is, is that why the New Jersey Water Authority wants to connect with Israel and figure out how they solve their problem? <laughs> well, you know what? There's actually an amazing museum here, uh, right near to where we live. In fact, it's kind of behind my head, if you can see in the picture over there, there is an amazing museum that demonstrates uh, for visitors who want to learn how Israel recycles 60% of its water. It's just amazing what we've been doing out of necessity, of course, but that necessity has driven us to such so much innovation when it comes to dealing with water that there really is much to learn. We're the first country, by the way, to now actually take divert water from the Mediterranean Sea into the Sea of Galilee from it from a salt water to um, sweet water with desalination in the process. So we've gained that kind of an experience. Think of the implications of that. It's just huge. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Flowing water as part of the water purification is also symbolic of other things in Judaism. Flowing water is often referred to as, as either life or, or Torah itself, the constant learning of Torah is like a flow of water. So there, there's an awful lot of layered symbolism going on in the purification ritual. And it, it's, it strikes me as interesting that many religions have pure water purification rituals. It seems to be almost a universal uh, method 
to do something and correct something. I know for, for personally, uh, at least once a year, I, I do this ritual and it's, um, it's typically just before Yom Kippur when Thank you me. really want to come out of the day of Yom Kippur with a sense of, uh, of starting a new, a new page. And it really, it's, I'm sure just like those who baptize, it's, it's an amazing feeling to connect to the source of life, which is water, and to immerse yourself entirely and to let that water work on you, to actually let it, let it purify you. It's, it's, it does. There's some amazing research done in Japan, <laughs> of all places. There's an amazing yeah. researcher who did some amazing, who found out amazing things about water. How water, um, first of all, water truly reflects the spirit around it. If you, he, he, sh he showed how if, if people go around a, a basin of water and they behave, say all kinds of ugly things or whatever it is, the water changes. And if you freeze it and you see the crystals in it, you see that the crystals are all broken and it's, it's a mess. And then if people go around it and they say beautiful things and they sing and, they, and there's a lot of love in the atmosphere, the water looks pure and pristine and it's just amazing. The water is not a passive medium. It's something that is very impacted by, by its surroundings in spirit. And that's why in, in, in the Jewish ritual, the water has to have a certain quantity so that it can actually impact you instead of you <laughs> impacting him. If you were to go into water, which is not live water with not enough quantity, then you wouldn't really be able to benefit of that. But when you go into a large or a significant enough body of water that was not touched by man, that came only in a natural way from, from the source, then it, it impacts you. Oh, there just, just a few thoughts. I know there's, there's only so much time we can talk about it, but it's amazing. It's very deep and it's even scientific. Yeah, it's really beautiful. I've seen that. There's one peculiar thing that's been running through my head and I, I didn't share it with the group, but I'll share it with the banker group here is that uh, this business about Moses, uh, you know, committing some sort of sin that doesn't seem so big, but it denied him entrance into the land. And um, the thing though, uh, is that um, it, it might be that God's answer was um, not now, Moses, uh, you're going back with Messiah to enter the land. And, um, uh, you know, it, 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 we, we are so focused on life now. And by the way, I do think there's much merit to living in the moment. But we forget the big picture that, um, that God has a, a, an amazing story that's happening here. And it's far from finished. Um, I think Alan shared about some of the laws, uh, you know, about categories of them and I, I apologize, Alan, because I'm forgetting the words, but one group of, of laws are really more about loyalty because they don't necessarily make sense at first, or maybe you just don't understand the why behind them well, as well as you would with some of the others. Yes. Full so, full yeah. Yeah. And that's the same with, with this whole picture and story uh, that uh, God Almighty has um, happening here. And so, but it does... Um, bridge you know thousands of years and moves into eternity when we think about the fact that uh, moses will enter the land there's there, there actually is a matter that says something similar to what you said but with a twist there is essentially god tells moses that all of those who study his teaching will essentially carry part of moses spirit so we might even be able to say that all of us are bringing moses into the land and the real challenge that we perhaps have is to take the teachings of moses and learn to apply them properly in the land of israel because for two thousand years we haven't really been able to engage in those aspects of it and i really feel that something is happening even in the realm of 
the study of Torah and how it impacts our lives. Something really huge is happening here in Israel that we will see with the next generation, for example, again, going back to the fact that every generation seems to have its role based on its past. Here, for example, Mo Moshe Rabbeinu, we mentioned this also in our group, he, for 40 years, he had to deal with a, with a slave mentality. And they had to be 40 years in the desert in order to get rid of that slave mentality. But when you deal with people like that, for 40 years, the pattern of behavior between you and the people becomes very, um, it, it, it becomes, it kind of fixed. He behaves here with the rock almost the same way he behaved last time they had to deal with the rock 40 years before, even though God tells him you've got to do it differently now. And then later on, when we get to the other stories later in the Parsha, Moses disappears. All of a sudden, it's Israel vows with regarding to the Canaanite kidnapping, and all of a sudden, Israel sings with regard and 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 the ministers. They are the ones who dig the well, and they. In other words, all of us, everybody was so used to in the desert to go to Moses and Aaron to solve any problem that they had, and now God is telling them, now you have to educate them how they have to talk to the rock, how they have to start dealing with the challenges on their own. And I think that's part of us as parents learning how to let our children go. You know, there's a certain pattern of behavior within the family, parents and, and children, that comes a time and we kind of have to distance ourselves from our children so that they will be able to become more autonomous and do things on their own without their parents kind of being around there when they're in a way that they're used to asking their parents what they should do or their parents might say something if they don't do it right. So I think this is much a better understanding in the vein of what you said, John, of what's going on here with Moses. It's not so much a punishment for this act and that act. I think uh, somebody once said that everyone was trying to figure out what did Moses do wrong in the end they found 200 different reasons. And he says, this is, <laughs> Moses, he, instead of focusing on all the amazingly wonderful things that he did, they're focusing on all the possible things that he may have done wrong. So I, I think the real explanation is exactly that. There's a new generation, needs a new, new, new mode of leadership. Where as soon as God tells them that they're not going to the land, all of a sudden, Israel steps up and they deal with the kid with with the kidnapping they step up and they deal with the well they step up and they sing on their own to god and this is apparently what was necessary at that time one other so, uh, theme is that uh, captains go down with their ships and he was the leader of the generation in the desert and i i think again um Right. Um, my perspective is God is reconciling all things unto himself. So there is a place and a role for the generation in the desert. All those things that we look at and kind of judge harshly, uh, they're, they're still part of what's being reconciled. And so um, Moses and the generation of the desert mm -hmm. shall enter. If you look at the big, big picture beyond, beyond the space and time, they, they will enter. It's pretty remarkable and pretty amazing. Barak Hashem. Barak oh, Hashem, beautiful. I'd like to briefly build on something Yair just said. Uh, I'm looking at a, an article by uh, Rabbi Sachs, and he, just one paragraph. It says, in past ex essays, I have argued Moses did not sin. It was simply that he was the right leader for the generation that left Egypt, but not the right leader for the children who would cross the Jordan and engage in conquering a land and building a society. The fact that he was not permitted to lead the next generation was not a failure, but an inevitability. As a group of slaves facing freedom, a new relationship with God and a difficult journey, both physically and spiritually, the children of Israel needed a strong leader capable of contending with them and with God. But as builders of a new society, they needed a leader who would not do the work for them, but who would instead inspire them to do it for themselves. So that builds on what Yuju was talking about. Mm -hmm. there, there is one more thing that I would like to share if, uh, if we still have some time. Um, can, can I take off three minutes for this, uh, Gabe? 
Yeah, sure. This, you know, this whole thing about Edom, about them go asking to pass through and they didn't allow them to pass through. Um, later on in Deuteronomy, Moses, when he talks, tells the story of what happens afterwards with Sihon and Og, he actually says that Esav, the sons of Esav, gave them water and, and food. It seems to be kind of, kind of contradiction because in this week's Parsha, by the way, and in the Haftarah with Yiftach, with Jetach, it's very clear that Edom didn't let them through. But Moses actually claims that the sons of Esau did give them water and did, did, did accommodate their needs. So I've been thinking about this. Why, why did he have to do this? Um, knowing the outcome. Um, there's an untold story here that there's a difference of 20,000 uh, from the tribe of Menashe, when they're counted in the beginning of the desert and at the end of the journey, there's 20,000 more people at the end. Where did they come from? Why did half of the tribe of Menashe have to stay with the tribes of Ruvain and God? Isn't that kind of demoting half of the tribe of Menashe and saying, you're not going to enter the land? They didn't ask to stay there. I think that what, there are many indications also in Chronicles that suggest that the 20,000 that were added to the tribe of Menashe were already there. Already at the time of Pharaoh, they went to take care of the of the cattle and the, the and the sheep of Egypt in the in in uh, the Bashan, which is in the Golan Heights, and they did it for Pharaoh. But Sihon and Og, the Emirates, that came from the north, who were extremely powerful kings, they came over and they conquered that area. They also actually conquered the half tribe of Menashe, and now Moses and Israel are trying to figure out how are we going to free the half tribe of Menashe from these Amorites. So he has to find an excuse to do so. And he also does it in a way that catches them by surprise because he goes to Edom and they play this out. And it looks like Israel just doesn't have the, the will to fight. So whenever you just go out to them and you say, no way, you're not coming through, they just go away. So when they did the same thing to Og, to Sihon and Og, then they also kind of expected that if they would go out to them, Israel would simply go away. But instead, we attacked them and we won. And we won these two kings who were considered extremely powerful and some even say that they were like giants. And in doing so, I believe that Moses freed the half tribe of Menashe. And some people ask, why did Moses even have to conquer the Golan Heights before Israel went into the land? I think it all had to do with really caring about any Jew, any Israelite who's in captivity by others. We see it in this week's Parsha as well. The Canaanite king comes and by Yeshman and Hoshevi, he takes of them um, um, to, 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 they're kidnapped and Israel goes ahead and they vow and they go ahead and they free them. I think we see this spirit to this very day that we must never leave anybody behind. They always have to make sure that anybody who needs us to, to free them of captivity uh, will do so. I think it's the job of the nations today to free Israel out of captivity to go back to the land that God wants us all to go back to. So we can all respect that need of freeing anybody that's in captivity so that they can fulfill the potential that God has placed within each and every one of us. Thank you, Yair. That's, that's definitely something that uh, a lot of us take seriously to pray about and take action on in ways that are appropriate. So. Kim, looks like you're just about to say one last thing. Just one last thing. I know. Okay, okay. quick though, because we're, we're past time. So in the Haftar portion, it is a Sihon that comes back 
to Israel and, and they're, they're complaining. And they said, you have our land. You stole our land. This belongs to us. And it's amazing that Jephthah, he actually gives a whole argument as to why this land belongs to us. And I couldn't help but think this is our argument as to why this land belongs to us. Now, cool. Right. <laughs> Beautiful. Everything's relevant. The red heifer is relevant <laughs> for now, right? Everything is relevant. Absolutely. Well, thank you, everybody. I wish you all a Shavuot Tov. Have a great week. Oh. Thanks for staying a little later. Everyone feel good. All yeah. right. Absolutely. Healthy. Shavuot Tov. We're also enjoying to dig deep and see if we can come up with some other reasons that make sense in our culture, in our history, as to why these laws are meaningful. And I read you some of what Rabbi Sachs said, which sort of relates to this whole concept of mitigating the fear of death and continuity of, of generations. Um, and this idea of linking ourselves to purification rituals, which has to do with getting us ready to do more sanctified things, such as entering the land of Israel, such as going into the temple, such as interrelating with each other on a higher level. So purification, and this is probably true in many religions, not even unique to Judaism. Uh, you've got uh, ritual purifications of Christianity. You've got you know uh, baptism through water, things like that. So there are some commonalities that cut across monotheistic religions dealing with water, dealing with uh, purifications, and in some forms of Christianity, they even use ashes uh, at times. So you can actually see some symbolic aspects, mm -hmm. but it relates back to our dealing with the anxiety around this concept of death that we all have to deal with since the fall of Adam and Eve from uh, the Garden of Eden, where they took on a more mortal existence from what otherwise would have occurred had they not eaten that fruit from the tree. Yeah, that's, uh, in fact, it's very interesting um, that we can go back that far with this particular Torah commentary. Um, there is, uh, you know, this is a, this is a, a, a commentary or a story um, about paradox. The very fact that a high priest would, you know, officiate this ritual, he would put the ashes of the red heifer into the water, and the one who had touched someone dead, and we know there is the, the, the whole understanding that death is associated with sin. You know, there's even that the saying that the, the wages of sin is death. I mean, this is the outgrowth of sin. And that takes us back to Adam. And so we find that, that we have death and we have that spiritual component. But here, the high priest, the paradox of the whole thing is that when the one who has touched someone dead, who's been put outside the camp, the sinner, he goes into the water and he is set free and there's commentary actually that talks about it's set free from the spirit like the spirit of satan set free literally uh from the the associated effects of sin and then that um in turn though the high priest himself becomes defiled for the day and anyone that is associated with this process they have to cleanse themselves, sit outside the camp for a day. And so we have this whole uh, amazing paradox uh, that exists in this particular Parsha. And I just uh, wanted to share a commentary on this because it's so true. And it says here, a word must be said, um, and I'm reading out of the Sancino Kumash, and this is a Chazal commentary, which means it's it's like a common a commentary from the rabbis themselves. Okay, a word must be said on the paradox of the para aduma, which is the red heifer. 
the simultaneous possession of sanctification and defilement. There have been great institutions and movements in both Jewish and general history that have sanctified others and yet have at the same time tended to defile those that created or directed those institutions and movements. The very men who helped others to self-sacrifice, uh, to that helped others to self self-sacrifice and holiness, not infrequently themselves became hard and self-centered, hating and hateful, elevating others and themselves, sinking into inhumanity, impurity, and unholiness. It is a real, if disturbing, fact in the spiritual life of a man. And so I don't know if anyone has ever encountered that. <clears throat> I have personally, where you find that someone who was so very, very uh, spiritual, helping others, mm -hmm. you know, constantly building them, and they end up themselves in, in a moral relationship, hardened in the heart, going to, it, it, there's, there's this, this remarkable connection between purification and defilement and spirituality and defilement. And, and it is so interesting how God deals with this and notice the way he deals with it is through separation. And so often wow. people get involved in helping others, but once that person themselves is on the right path, they never separate to re, re uh, you know, get themselves, it, reposition themselves with Hashem. Let's just say, regroup. say yeah, that. regroup. And so wow. it begins that defilement begins to take them down a road. I, I found that commentary, Alan, extremely uh, fascinating. And I have, every time I've read this, I, I don't know, I must be through this about 30 times or more, <laughs> this uh, uh, Kumash. And uh, it's just always, um, you know, it always, and the and that that I mentioned this whole thing about the the evil spirit that's associated, but that's actually from a Jewish source, and it actually comes from Yochanan ben Zakkai in a midrash, and coming out saying uh, there is a whole midrash here, <laughs> but uh, this one part about it it says uh, that Yochanan ben Zakkai replied by referring him to a pagan analogy. Just as a person afflicted by melancholy or, or possessed by an evil spirit is freed from his disease by taking certain medication, um, medic, medicaments or by burning a certain root, in the same manner the ashes of the red heifer prepared in the prescribed way and dissolved in water drive away the unclean spirit of defilement resulting from the contact with the blood. So that's where that one one of the things I always find fascinating about arcane rituals is that you know in the modern era very often you you'll hear people who scoff at religion and they'll talk about empty rituals. Yeah. Like they're mindless, right? And I can't tell you how many conversations I had with people and I said, well, maybe the ritual has a purpose. Maybe there's some symbolism there. Maybe it's meant for you to contemplate that symbolism and therefore get yourself into a headspace where you can come back to Hashem, where you can do that regrouping as, as Miss, Mrs. Hunt said, right? right? So people don't realize that rituals are used not in primitive societies, but even in modern societies. I can make all kinds of arguments that even secular people have rituals in their life, whether it's yep. checking their phone three times a day or yep. whatever it is, yep. you know, they do it for a reason. They do it for a psychological lifeline. So that's really significantly human to think of. 
So religion does exactly the same thing. It had a better conception of the stress on human psychology and this nearness to death is one of them. Uh, I was reading a note on a, on a related topic by Rabbi Eliezer Mizell in, in an article where he refers to the, the, uh, the ritual of the red cap as related to the tabernacle. So how so? Well, after Sinai, the Jews had reached or recaptured that level of being on the same level as, as Adam and Eve temporarily. They didn't hold on to it very long. They lost it. And the response of that after that story was God commands them to build the tabernacle and it becomes the permanent place of meeting with God thereafter throughout history. So the, the Jews retrieved that status of Adam and Eve, but then they again lost it. So, and how did they lose it through the, uh, the golden calf episode? So the burning of the red heifer is also a reminder of trying to remain pure and remembering what happened to us in the desert when we lost that status of being on the same level as Adam and Eve. And that's obviously where we want to get back to at some time in the distant future. So the linkage to the tabernacle and why we were given the tabernacle and the golden calf was also another linkage in the Parsha itself to other Parshas that happened earlier in the history. You know what, Alan, you just led me to a question I thought of while you were giving your, your, your talk. Mm. And that is the fact that the, the incident or the event with Miriam is not chronological. Mm -hmm. This event actually happened earlier than this spot. And yet we're dealing with the same issues we're dealing with in the um, the red heifer. We're dealing with death, we're dealing with water. And I thought, if this is not chronologically in order, why did Moses place this event following the Parama Adama? So what is, he did it for a reason, what could be the connection between Miriam, the rock, and the red heifer. Oh my! Oh my. Well, I, I, <laughs> I tried to. I was sitting there thinking, but now I was going through it. I was like, "Whoa, what's the getting?" Well, I, I think there are two. <laughs> there are two significant deaths, right? Like immediately following this, right? And I yeah, wonder right. if mm -hmm. a part of it had to do with it was a setup for dealing with very significant losses of leaders uh, within, and then the mourning, and then also maybe the rituals surrounding uh, the death, the handling of the death of, I mean, Aaron, they bring him up on the mountain. So it seems like it's quite isolated, but with Miriam, you know, uh, immediately after, it's just interesting because it's Miriam and Aaron, like, so the, they're, they're connected, right? And, um, you know, even going right back to the, the time where they were speaking against Moses's wife and then, you know, had that little spat. <clears throat> so I would think that the other interesting thing is in the, in the passage, when it's dealing with the red heifer, it's always talking about Eliezer. It's not talking about Aaron, right? It sure. says Eliezer will take it. And you're like, but wait a minute, Aaron's not dead yet. So why wouldn't Aaron take it? And then you're right. Like then you're like, oh, it's a, it's out of sequence chronologically in terms of when it was given. But I think it's a death. I think it's a this conversation around death. The other thing too, as I think maybe, maybe we we focus a little bit too much on the ashes, because it's you know that's what immediately comes from the red heifer. But the water—that's the water part. The, the water, water part. exactly. So for me, I was like, well, maybe like really, it's all about the water. Is that the ashes go into the water, and uh, to me. I immediately go back to the beginning of Genesis with water, that this is like the water represents kind of like the raw material of creation. It's like oh, the most okay. like pristine state before it becomes organized into specific things. It's like raw yeah. potential, right? And so wow. the heifer's ashes, you know, in some ways representing the, uh, the impurity, you know, going back into water, and then it's really the water is the emphasis in the sense that it's like what was created, what has now died, or it needs to be kind of brought back into that state of just raw potential again. 
and I, I and I paralyzed that a little bit with um, you know, the golden calf, right? Because the golden calf, they grind it into dust, they burn it, and then they put it into it water, water and then they drink it. You know, so again, the same pattern that you know is worth thinking about, I guess. That right. Maybe- so so there's this recurring theme <sighs> of purification rituals, right? And the idea is to get back to being holier, right? Because if you read through the, the Torah text, the narrative, people are on a high and they come down. People get back to a high and they come down. It's a repeating cycle. And there's always a need for purification. Now, here they are sitting literally on the boundary of entering the land of Israel, where they're going to lose a lot of immediate miracle divine protection, and they're going to have to live a more mundane life. They're going to have to deal with life and death and birth and all of that. So they need to be on a higher level to enter the land to maintain high levels because they're going to be dealing with mundane life rather than living a life of miracles, being covered by clouds, being given water miraculously. Their shoes not wearing Manna from heaven, manna from heaven. All of those miracles are going to end. So they need to constantly be repurifying themselves throughout the vagaries of ordinary life and death. So this is a setup to start training them that they need to keep getting back to that pure state. So I think that's why purification rituals start to become habitual or need to be habitual. And one of the questions I was asking about was how that relates to today. Today, in in the moral climate we're living in, a lot of people don't feel a big need to purify themselves. They don't feel the need to elevate themselves. And other than through prayer, many people wouldn't even think of purification rituals of one sort or another, right? But as we all know, conversions usually involve water too. So conversions involve a certain degree of purification. Uh, In the Jewish religion, through the menstrual cycle, women go back to the mikvah, they immerse once a month. Why? To purify themselves, bring themselves up to a higher level again, to re-engage in marital relations. So purification is an ongoing living thing, a constant reminder of where we need to strive to get back to. And outside of religious circles, in whatever religion we're in, you don't see a big need for rituals like that because nobody feels the need to purify or elevate themselves morally. And it seems like the society constantly declines on a moral basis. It has nothing to reinforce their daily way of looking at life. So that's where I was going with that question. You know, that's interesting because it connects with something that Gabriel, when you said that, and connected it to the golden calf. You know, I thought, I thought, you know, the golden calf could not atone because it did not have blood. The Torah says life is in the blood. Oh, wow. Take flesh and blood to atone. And this is why a whole flesh and blood atonement is set up with with the sacrificial system. This is so interesting that that is a red heifer because we have and the rabbis say the red represents dumb it's the blood you know and we have flesh in place of a golden calf <clears throat> not a tongue hashem was teaching the people that atonement had to come through blood they're very interesting um very interesting difference mm-hmm. i just for sure uh, and then you know going back also the, the connection with water then it gets connected to to water so it's very interesting what you just said and it's true this that in judaism there is a very definite um focus i mean not just once a year on yom kippur which we do have every year Yom Kippur is this whole day of complete, total, absolute fasting. It is uh, a time, a communal time of complete regeneration. But not only that, we have other fasting days of communal fasting, but the women do go to the mikvah and the men also go to the mikvah. 
Mm -hmm. There is a real focus on this, this uh, need to really uh, put yourself in front of a mirror and to, you know, really seek Hashem to, to really, uh, you know, be cleansed and to be regenerated as well. Very definite mm -hmm. uh, focus on that in Judaism. I, I like what you're saying about the regeneration with the emphasis, you can't be holier than that. If you have to constantly purify yourself, it means that you've fallen down on the on the job, so to speak, right? So there's this cyclical attempt to keep reinvigorating, repurifying, and regenerating, right? Because it's hard to maintain that level of holiness. It's hard to maintain those delicate sensibilities. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember reading a book talking about the commandments that a Jew has to, uh, is obligated to. And one of the questions I used to get from some friendly Gentiles was, it's impossible to do 613 commandments. And I said, how? He says, you can't do 613 every day. And I said, you don't understand the commandments. They're not all situated in the day. Some of them are once a year, like Yom Kippur. Some of them are once a week, like the Sabbath, right? They're constant with the meals when you're keeping kosher. That's three times a day, right? But there are other rituals that are either role-based, time-based, place-based. There are rituals and there are commandments you can't do unless you're in Israel. There are commandments you can't do unless you're in the Holy Temple. The Holy Temple temporarily is at a commission. So you don't do those commandments. So when it comes down to it, it's somewhere between 50 and 70 commandments a day that you can even possibly do depending on whether you're a man or a woman or a Kohen or whatever else. So it turns out it's a much more doable enterprise than people think. But even that takes effort. And sometimes we fall down on the job and we need these kinds of rituals to reinvigorate us, to remind us, to focus us, to get back to those purification levels. And that's something I think that's missing in modern secular society where those levels of morality are fluid. I'm being kind. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, and there are no reminders. In fact, there's a de deliberate attempt not to have any reminders. So uh, I think it's very re relevant to the social situation we're finding us in, in the modern era, mm -hmm. which leads to the crazy politics that yes. Kim was making jokes about earlier. <laughs> that's my question i cannot shake it um if it fits let's take it away if it doesn't i'm wondering um okay let's just say the people in israel the the, the sec quote unquote secular jews that are not doing what they're supposed to be doing how do you guys feel about your brothers and sisters okay first of all I, I want to answer that question. Okay, I just, I, I, let me, okay but, uh, I'm gonna let you finish. Yeah, I'm gonna let you finish. But okay. I really want. How many Jews in Israel really believe in all the miracles that happened to the Israelites when they came out of Egypt? I mean, they actually believe it and talk about it. I mean, I just I love studying with you guys and how deep you go and how much of the scriptures you get and how, what you believe. But then how do you feel about your brothers and sisters who are not purifying and not following Torah? And okay, go ahead, Kim. You know what? What a great, this was the topic at our Shabbat dinner table. On oh, Shabbat. okay. And because, um, because there is a divide between the religious and the secular here. Yes, that's even if you know, Biachad, even if it's one nation. And so we have to remember that Hashem says, I'm going to, about the nation, uh, he said, I'm going to bring you back in unbelief. Then I'm going to bring you in unbelief. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So I'm going to bring you back in unbelief really, to rebuild this nation. And I always joke, I said, you know, God could never send the religious to rebuild the nation because yeah. nothing would ever get done. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <that's good. laughs> Okay, yeah. now the other thing people don't realize that the secular in Israel, the majority of secular Israelis have a very deep belief in God. That's they, what I wondered. Yeah. They just do not take upon themselves 
the orthodox religion right. that is here in the land. Now, let's take that a little bit further. Mm -hmm. The interesting thing about the secular, in fact, let me just see, actually say this as well. This is the only country in the world where you will go to a secular meeting and the Torah will be on stage. I okay. mean, just trust in, every, I don't care whether it's academic, it, 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 the Torah will always come up in some type yeah. of way. Yeah. And so, you know, so God in his, really in his wisdom, all right, he brought the secular back. I mean, <laughs> Russia of all things. Okay. I mean, yeah. it just doesn't get any more secular than this. Yeah. And he brings them back to Truth build the land. Got he it. starts to draw them. And so they get involved with God. You talk about miracles. Yes, the majority believe in miracles. And even if the rabbis will say, well, we don't have miracles like we did before, so many people will say, oh, every day. <laughs> Now, the other thing is that there's also another very interesting perspective here in Israel. Israelis do not see themselves as Jews. And oh. that is a big opener for Jews that are from the diaspora. Or I may actually even say it this way. Wow. They don't see themselves as diaspora Jews. They are Israelis. They think differently. They see God differently. They don't want to be shackled. They feel by uh, unnecessary, uh, you know, religious uh, um, uh, performance or, you know, religious uh, laws, 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 laws. However, however, with that said, and, and they, I, I have been in meetings and they'll say, well, We'll send the invitations to the Israelis. You send the invitations to the Jews. I'm not kidding. I've been in these really? kinds of meetings. It, and it taught me so much about these dynamics between these two, two groups. But the interesting thing about what's happening with Israelis, all right? They're very spiritual people. Israelis are very spiritual. And um, when, I started, uh, when I started coming to land uh, over 30 years ago, um, I went to a, a, a synagogue in Tel Aviv and that synagogue could barely ever get a, a minion ever. Like they couldn't have 10 Jews in there to start prayer for the day. And I'd be sitting there. It was just usually me and a few others. <laughs> and that would be it. We do our prayers and we go. And this went on for years like this. Now, that same synagogue today, if I show up on a Friday night, this is in Tel Aviv, not Yerushalayim. I show up on a Friday night, same synagogue. There will be easily between five to 800 young people in that synagogue. There is something happening. And this is what Hashem promised when he said to Yeshiahu, he said to Isaiah, in that day, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. There's something happening here in Israel to Israelis that are bringing them closer and closer to the depths of searching the Torah. And many of them then get involved with Orthodox Judaism. I mean, it's like a process. They go through this process and then they come into, or then they don't see anymore um the the process is burdensome but the process now is what's bringing them closer and closer to a shem. Mm -hmm. so that's a really well, beautiful thing. to build on what kim was just saying i came out of a secular jewish home we were proud to be jews but we really didn't do anything mm -hmm. uh, come to come to mid 60s there's this epiphany and myself and a number of other people in my generation we get with the program and we start learning so I didn't grow up Orthodox. I chose to be Orthodox, right? But it came out of an epiphany moment. I came out of the United States Army. Certain things didn't make sense to me. Certain realizations occurred to me. I made a commitment, went out, found myself an observant girl, got married, and the rest is history, and I'm married 50 years. So uh, it, it's, it, it's a growth process, 
And when you asked how we feel about it, I for one feel responsible for these okay. Jews. Yep. Um, I learn online, I have, ele I have 11 learning partners throughout the week. Four of them come okay. from a secular background, four of them. And they don't know why they want to learn either. And it's always fascinating. I always ask them the question, like, why do you want to learn it? Before I ask them what you want to learn. I want to know why they're here. Now, some of them, if they're religious or they're observant in some sense, that you already know why they want to learn. But those who are coming to it brand new sometimes can't even articulate it. Yes. Something is pushing them. So I said, great. So we're starting with a clean slate. You don't know anything. You're not even sure why you're here. Let's explore what turns you on in terms of Judaism, whether it's halacha, whether it's history, whether it's, uh, you know, Jewish philosophy, whatever it is, and we find a way, right? Yeah. Uh, I think there's a reference in the Talmud that says that, you know, if, if a person opens their heart, just a pinhole, you know, somehow it, it, you can pierce that and open it up into something wider and better. And I've been learning with these people for about two and a half years. Yeah. And they have grown enormously. Two of them have taken on regular prayer. I didn't push it. I was there to share knowledge, but they finally got with the program. They're wow. starting to talk to Hashem. That's how it happens. Yeah, exactly how it happens. Exactly. And we see this. It's just, it's, it's absolutely remarkable. Wow. So this, you know, I don't look at secular here like I look at secular in America. Very, very okay. different. Also. Okay. Mm -hmm. Very different. But as Alan said, <clears throat> it's a process learning to know Hashem. And you have to be willing to just open your arms and say, okay, let's go. Mm -hmm.